what's firing off in your brain as both a human and a creative when you're helping to assemble all these brilliant minds and capturing their innovative projects and devices? Because in addition to seeing their processes and the good work that they are doing to better understand animals and our world and how to better protect them, I'm also intrigued by the prospect of them all getting together and learning from each other. Well, that's the that's the exciting that's the exciting thing about the project, and um, and particularly for the listening to our planet episode in in Earth Sounds, which looks at how we can how we can use sound to sort of better protect the planet, to to sort of mitigate against things like climate change, to protect endangered species. So um, so one of one of the joys of doing what I do is 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 meeting meeting people doing amazing things around the world like Boran and Beth and and it's a it's a it's a true honor to do that and you know and exciting things come from that and and um you know and it's, it's a it's sort of a always a sort of creative project but um so as filmmakers we're thinking how can we best tell this story and and sort of capture the the the, the essence of the story but my my background's actually as a sort of radio journalist so I've always come from a a world of sound and uh, sounds always been incredibly important to me in terms of storytelling so earth sounds was like the dream project basically it was a, a chance to do um to do to to, to tell um, natural history stories through through sound in a way that i don't think's been done before and um and the exciting thing about listening to our our planet episode is is to delve into into the ways that sounds being used to to sort of better protect the planet and um to to look work with um, people like uh, Boran at Rainforest Connection and, and Beth with with Wave Glider to to just look at the incredibly creative ways we're using sound to to um, better the planet. Dr. Goodwin and uh, Mr. Yassin, how what have you learned from each other's work, and what aspects of this series have you personally most gravitated to that maybe has put something into perspective that you quite hadn't before? Yeah, so watching the episode, listening to planets, there were several, you know, several different acoustics. Being involved in acoustics myself for the last 15 years, I'm actually a marine biologist, not necessarily an acoustician, but I've learned a lot about acoustics. And I've also learned a lot about the new technology that's being used in ways uh, to preserve the planet, to listen to intricate uh, sounds like they're doing in Costa Rica to not only help detect what species are there, but also in essence, to be able to tell when some illegal uh, forest, forestry is going on. And I think that's really, really amazing. Same thing with some of the other episodes with the walrus and, and with the birds the birds in the spring and, and just being able to tell when a forest is going silent or potentially getting so dry that the birds have left that you know it becomes a potential fire hazard um dry 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 forest with our wave glider and our sounds that that we've done just being able the ocean is still such an unexplored area to yeah. be able to acoustically run around and get in areas that ships typically the reason we went to the area that we went in the middle of the winter is none of the other vessels the NOAA ships all these other vessels don't tend to go in that area because the weather's too rough but you can send a wave glider through hurricanes and it's no problem mm -hmm. so uh that was pretty cool we also went through Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument into areas that NOAA ships didn't want to get in that close because of shallowness and they're a big ship so just the the innovations of our technology being able to push science and ask questions further. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, you know, we spend a lot of time at Rainforest Connection uh, sort of talking to people about sound, right? It's it's a sometimes it's difficult to uh, showcase the power of sound and how important it is for biodiversity monitoring, but for for conservation in general. Right. Um, and, and especially in, in a lot of situations where sound often yields to a very large data set, uh, lots of data that makes it pretty daunting for scientists, for researchers, even for conservation organizations to really uh, go into it and, you know, try to make the best use of it. And I think one of the really cool things about 
uh, Earth Sound is that they managed to create 10 episodes that were about sound, which is amazing. Seeing all these different applications around the world, um, seeing all these clever ways that sound is being used. Um, I think that was the highlight. And it just, mm -hmm. it's a way for us, you know, organizations that have been using acoustics for a long time uh, to be able to kind of showcase that work and highlight the importance of sound and conservation. I think that that was one of the, the key highlights for me across all these different examples. So much of what you all do requires a great deal of patience. It, as Beth mentioned, it took five months for the wa uh, the wave glider to carry out its task, and it likely took years to develop and prep it. And same with the Guardian. I'm sure yeah. since gathering the data that you all have, how you approach things and your goals have evolved. Can you speak to how your goals have evolved? Because already I'm thinking like anybody else that's probably watched, that watched this, like the, the Guardian needs to be in like every forest and the wave glider needs to be running constantly to inform shipping patterns and things like that. So I'm just genuinely yeah, curious. Yeah, I mean, I can answer this first. I think for me, um, uh, like, I've, I've assembled every single one of those guardians myself. Like that's what I, you know, do because that, because the part of that process involves me as an engineer to essentially like iterate on it to make it better as I learn about all the things that happen on the ground. And I think what evolved over the years, especially as we grew and as the need for, for something like a guardian uh, became necessary is to, to, to look at possibilities of scale something that could scale beyond the limited capacity that we have as an organization. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're only so many people. And uh, if we want to scale this to something like you, like you said, Preston, where it could be in, in everywhere in the world, not just in the places that it's in right now, mm -hmm. we have to make it so easy and we have to make it so simple and utilizing off the shelf stuff that it could be built locally in these areas. I think that, for us, that's kind of like what we learned along the years and kind of the next step forward is how can we open this technology and make it available so somebody could walk into a few stores locally in their country, buy the parts off the shelf and assemble it and make a guardian themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're heading towards. We've open sourced the code. Uh, we've certainly on our, on our way to open the, the hardware and we'd hope that at some point, many, many people could build their own guardians and they could deploy them. And I think that's the best way to scale it. So that's kind of what we're looking at from our standpoint on how we can leverage this uh, further and then continue exploring the science of, of bioacoustics and looking at different ways that we can use AI to explore more and more of the data. What we're collecting is a snapshot in history because this, this, the forest is never gonna sound the same again. So there's really, we're like building a museum, a library of sound where we're taking a snapshot in time that we don't know what, this, what the forest is gonna sound like a year from now or two years or five years from now. We also haven't explored everything in that sound. New technologies will come up, new models will come up that will allow us to explore further and analyze further you know, the sound. So this is like, the golden training data. Imagine like ChatGPT training data is disappearing. And mm. this is like the golden training data that will disappear and it will essentially serve a purpose in the future that we haven't discovered yet. And that's what we've been trying to do with Arbimon, our online platform is to store and maintain all of, all of this data because we think it's that, that important for, for the world eventually. Using the wave glider, a, a, a remote vehicle like this out in the ocean, yes, you're right. It it has potential for, for instance, <clears throat> detecting uh, tsunamis. You know, detecting yeah. it, it's such a, it's such a non-invasive way to study the uh, the uh, natural world, but also in a military perspective. For instance, it can tell you it can detect different. Uh, engine sounds and it can detect if you have vessels coming into an harbor illegally or fishing around an island illegally or pirates for instance so the 
sound is is a way that's that can kind of connect everything and pick up things that we are aren't even sure what they are or why we're using them. For instance, <clears throat> I think you know you you hear about the Internet of All Things. Mm -hmm. Well, there could be the Internet of All Sounds globally, including all the different types of recordings and acoustic eavesdropping, so to speak. That's that's going on where we can predict in advance things that uh, that we aren't don't even know that we're going to be able to predict. There's still so many questions that are going to come up as we as we continue this path. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Essien, you actually made me think of something in your explanation, and I apologize if this is a silly question, but it just kind of came to my mind as you were explaining. <laughs> like you have so many things that you want to accomplish, and things are going to evolve, like we were just talking about that some of these wants and desires that we have through the work that we all do that we're not likely going to see them. We're going to see some, a lot of progress in some areas, but we're not going to see it the way that we necessarily want. It's going to like happen down the line, hopefully through the the work that you all do. Is it like a strange realization that you're going to have to like essentially like pass the torch on and, and, and you just hope that the, the next people that are involved or the, anybody that you're working with is going to pick it up in a fashion that makes you proud to be a stepping stone in discovery and protection. Yeah, I think for me, for instance, there's so much data that we have that I would love to be able to analyze, but I'm not going to get to it, you know, okay. and it's archived. And I hope some graduate student somewhere <laughs> decides to go through and understand why we heard where all the minky wells, what the different vocalizations are between the East, the Central and the West and mark exactly where it occurred. And, and as shipping lanes increase, and as we're trying to use acoustics to help deter shipping lanes, the wave glider, for instance, is also helping to, de helping to, de to figure out um, currents and where ships could go faster instead of using as much fuel. Just literally a mile away, the current's a different direction. And, and we don't really know that, you know? Um, we didn't know that until this wave glider went at one and a half miles across the ocean and uh, one and a half knots across the ocean and figured out currents are different. So yes, in my lifetime, the, the data that we've gathered, I mean, I have so many more questions to ask with our, with my data and it's not, so the disparity is, yeah, it's not going to all get answered, but the progress and the movement and the continuation is in leaps and bounds. Maybe this set of data or these questions won't, but leaps and bounds of what can get done. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to your to your point and your question, yeah, there, there's a lot of elements of what we do. You don't get to see it in your lifetime or at least in like the short period of time. But I think if you focus all on that, you'll go insane because humans are, you know, they have the tendency to want to see the, the, the fruits of the labor. So I think if we if you mix it up with a um, ability to see these results in a short term basis, and then also while doing you know the the stuff that benefits the people that come after, that's sort of how we approach things mm. in many ways. Uh, so you know we focus on some immediate sort of short term benefits that we can get, like the example that you saw in the documentary. The Puerto Rican, uh, the, the the Puerto Rico project. There's an element of that where we were able to basically do a study that shows us showed us that Puerto Rico is getting drier. It showed us that uh, uh, animals, particularly coquis and other type of amphibians, are moving to higher elevations. So we were able to make like very direct recommendations. We also remapped protected areas in Puerto Rico from the areas that they had before. So we got this like instant gratification that we were able to make a difference quickly. And I think that this is so important to the livelihood and to just the, the psyche of people to give them the ability to see results of their hard work in, in, in a relatively short term basis, it gives them that fuel to continue more. Uh, so we, we do elements of that because I think that that is important for just the health of the team in general, while also kind of trying to use this as a the combination of it yields to the long-term effects that hopefully we can leave uh for uh for the future so we try to we try to play a balance between the two if that makes sense